Hello and welcome back to Let's Code Physics. We are in episode number five of our subscriber tribute. Uh, we have set up this code successfully to where uh, each country from which we have subscribers um, is represented by one bouncy ball in this blue box here. Uh, we have successfully implemented the code to where the bouncy balls are interacting with each other. They are uh, interacting via a, um, a purely elastic collision so that both the uh, total kinetic energy and the total momentum are conserved before and after each collision. Um, we've also set it up to where the size of each bouncy ball and the mass of each bouncy ball is proportional to the number of subscribers uh, from each country in which we have subscribers. And so this has been great. This is a wonderful little animation. Um, you can download it from, uh, from the previous video. I, I always uh, leave a link to all the uh, code that I develop. Um, and you can sit there and watch this for hours. I could personally sit there and watch this for hours. Uh, but there's also other sorts of studies that we can do with this. Um, <clears throat> one thing we could look at would be to look at some of the uh, some of the ensemble properties of this of this box of bouncy balls. The idea is that when you've got many many particles um, you don't necessarily want to measure velocity of this one and velocity of this one and velocity of this one. Uh, you want to sort of measure some averages. You want to get some uh, properties that measure the averages of these things. And that's really what the study of thermodynamics is, is the study of average uh, of the average of many, many uh, uh, particles. So what I'd like to put in uh, today is some calculations to uh, to calculate the temperature of this ensemble of particles and the pressure along the walls. That's what you would measure in a gas, for example, would be the temperature and the pressure. Um, we're going to leave volume out of the considerations today. We'll add that in in the next episode when we move things to 3D. Okay, so what I can do to, uh, let's think about measuring the temperature first. When we think about temperature, we usually uh, colloquially talk in terms of how hot or cold something is. Physically, what temperature is, is it's a measure of the, um, it's a measure of the average kinetic energy of all the particles in a sample. Um, and that definition right there gives you an idea of why uh, temperature can never uh, go below absolute zero is because you can't have a negative kinetic energy, therefore you can't have less than absolute zero temperature. Um, that's just sort of the basic definition of absolute zero. So what I can do is I've already got um, some lines in to calculate the, uh, the total kinetic energy. We had that in uh, in an earlier episode where I was trying to debug a, uh, an, er an error in the code. Uh, so I've actually already got that in place. Basically within each of the motion within each uh, pass of the motion loop uh, we start out with the kinetic energy equal to zero and I just scroll down here and I've already got this line here to calculate the uh, the kinetic energy so this is technically calculating the total kinetic energy um, well actually it's not doing that yet so we need to multiply by half but again that's just multiply everything by a half so that's just a scale factor it's not going to change the qualitative behavior and then technically if I wanted this to be the average um, I should take the kinetic energy value and um, and divide it by the uh, total number of particles. So what I can do is after I leave the bouncy ball list, actually let's put that into here where I've already got the statement to print the kinetic energy. Uh, I can say the kinetic energy is equal to kinetic energy divided by the number of bouncy balls. Actually let's not call that the kinetic energy, let's call that the uh, temperature. There we go. So here we've got a calculation of the temperature as just the average kinetic energy. So we've taken each kinetic energy, added them up, and we are divided by the number of bouncy balls. The basic definition of an average, take the total, divide it by the number of, of particles. Um, and then let's have this thing print the kinetic energy. Now you never, you always want to avoid having a code uh, just print numbers, so you always want to give some kind of label to it. So we're going to say print K equals kinetic energy there. Cool. And then I need some, so so that gets me the, the, the temperature. Actually, I want the temperature, not the kinetic energy, don't I? Temp equals temp. And let's get rid of that comment there. There we go. Save. There we go. And actually, I can get rid of this comment too, I suppose. There we go. Save. Um, so that's a pretty straightforward way to get the temperature of the um, of the of the particles. Technically, I need to divide by the 
Boltzmann constant, and there's probably like a fraction in there or something. But the idea is that is that it's 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 the temperature is the average kinetic energy up to some constants, right? So any relationship I get for the average kinetic energy is going to be the same type of relationship for the temperature. Now, if I want to keep track of the pressure, so pressure is is this idea of force over area, right? So it's when one object strikes another object, it's the amount of force that's imparted divided by the amount of area that they have that they come into contact with. Well, if I think about it, the pressure that we have uh, going on in this box of bouncy balls is a collision between the particles and the uh, walls. Um, so the way I can think about that is I, I can only really calculate a pressure whenever there is a uh, whenever there is a collision. Now that's going to be over lots and lots of time. So I'm actually going to calculate that over the course of the entire time. So I'm actually going to start my pressure calculation outside the motion loop. We're going to say pressure equals zero, right? So basically with every collision, it'll add to the pressure as it were. Okay. So let's do this. So let's think about this. Um, so basically whenever there is a collision with a wall, I want to be able to add to the pressure. So I want to be able to say that pressure equals pressure plus the amount of force that's imparted divided uh, divided by the area it's imparted over. So I need to think about the force and I need to think about the amount of area. So let's think about the force first. Let's just put in a little uh, placeholder here. I want a force. I want to divide it by an area. So what I want to think about in terms of the force here is the, is the change in momentum of the bouncy ball. Now we already established that the, that for example, when it hits the, uh, when it hits, which, uh, let's see, which wall is this? This is the, checking whether this is the uh, rightmost wall, right, because it's checking the x position being greater than something. So if it strikes the right wall, the wall is only changing the bouncy ball's uh, x components of its velocity. It's not changing the y component of its velocity. So what I would do here is I would use the definition that force is the change in momentum. So I would have this be the mass of this bouncy ball, so mass list of IBB times the change in the velocity. But the change in velocity, it's just flipping it, so it's just two times the absolute value of the velocity's x component. Velocity list of IBB dot x. Cool. Close off the absolute value. That'll close off the force calculation. And so that is now the mass uh, times the change in velocity. So we've got the change in momentum. So we've got the change in momentum there, but force is change in momentum over change in time. And of course, the natural time step for all this to occur in is just this dt over here, the 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 time in between snapshots in the code. So we're going to divide that by dt. Cool. So that's the amount of force that the wall is exerting on the bouncy ball when it collides. And so what I need to think about now is I need to think about the amount of area that that's taking place over. So it's not taking place over the entire wall, it's taking place over that localized piece of contact. So I need to think about the size of the bouncy ball. So when the bouncy ball is headed toward the wall, what the wall sees is a circle. So I can just put in the area of the circle here. So that's going to be pi. We'll just give that out to a few decimal places. Pi r squared. So I need the radius of this bouncy ball. So I need bb list by bb dot radius squared. Cool. So here I've got the area, pi r squared. I've got the force divided by the area. That gives me the pressure. Cool. Awesome. Okay. And then what I can do is I can copy this down into the other pieces of the code. So here I'm changing. Uh, here's another, here's a collision again with the rightmost wall. So we'll do that. Here this time is a collision with the top wall. So I need to change this X into a Y. That's the only thing I need to change, I think. I got me into trouble last time, so let me double check on that. Cool. And then I can copy that and just paste it under here. Cool. So whenever the x velocity, whenever the x component of the velocity changes, I've got a pressure in terms of the uh, of the x velocity whenever the in terms of the x component of the velocity, whenever the y component changes, I've got a pressure in terms of the y component. And these will just add up as the amount of pressure that's exerted. Although now that I think about it, I don't really want to be 
adding that much pressure. I don't want to be adding up all that pressure or else all those pressure variables, or else it will uh, come to, or else it'll keep adding and adding and adding, it's just getting bigger and bigger. At the same time, I don't want my pressure to be varying wildly because there will be some time steps where there's no collision with a wall. And then there'll be some time steps where there are lots of collision with the wall. So what I actually want is an average pressure. Yeah, let's do that. An average pressure. I think this is what I want to do. And then within each loop, I want to have the pressure. Okay, so within each loop, I'll be totaling up the amount of pressure. And now the question is... How do I update the, to the this average pressure? Hmm. I think what I want to do is I want to do a time average of it. So that's, let's actually call this total pressure. Here's what I'm thinking is I define something called total pressure. And basically I keep adding this amount of pressure for each run to the total pressure and then I divide the total pressure by the amount of time that's transpired. That's pressure divided by time. Hmm. Oh, oh, I know what to do. I know what to do. Since it's an average, I need to keep track of the amount of pressure. I need to average it out over the number of time steps. The way to get number of time steps, total pressure equals total pressure plus pressure. The way I can get the average pressure Average pressure. The way I can get that is to take the total pressure and basically I need to divide it by the number of time steps that I've taken. Right? I need to divide it by the number of times that the loop has gone through. I could do that by simply putting in another counter and counting the number of times the loop has gone through, but another way I could do that, I'm already keeping track of the passage of time. Am I? Let's see, I started with t equals zero. I am not keeping track of the passage of time, am I? Let's see. Collision list. I'm looking for time equals something. DT. No, I'm not. Oops, okay, so I need to put that in. So I need to be updating time. Time equals time plus the time step. Here's what I can do is I can take the total amount of time, divide it by the time step. Because the total amount of time is just zero plus dt for every single time step. So this little division here will give me the number of time steps. Cool. So this should give me some measure of the average pressure. So let's see if that gives me some kind of stable number. Here we go. Oh, average pressure jumped up. Average pressure is changing. Okay. So I can see that the temperature is pretty consistent. Um, so I've, I've arranged things in the code to, uh, to keep conservation of kinetic energy. Um, it is changing a little bit. That's really an artifact of the time step size. There's not a whole lot to do to change that, but it's also not changing significantly. Um, the average pressure seems to also be leveling out. Um, well, now it's decreasing. You know, as soon as you say something level is leveling out, it's going to change, right? The, 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 the computer hears you saying that, you know. Um, but of course, I've also got a pretty spread out uh, box here. So, you know, these um, collisions aren't necessarily happening terribly frequently with the wall. So one thing I could do would be to make the, uh, the box smaller, or I can just let this thing run for long enough to where this thing averages out decently. Um, it's kind of hard to get a feel for that here. So one way I can do this, uh, that I can visualize, you know, how well these values are leveling out is to just create a graph. To do that, I have to add a call to visual.graph because the graphing commands are all separate. And what I'm going to do is here, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create graphs for pressure and temperature, temperature versus time. And I'm actually going to save this under another name just so that I don't mess up my code too much because we've seen what happens with that. Um, Scriber bouncy balls, uh, T and P calculations. There we go. Cool. So what I can do is I can say that there's a graph. Let's call it temp graph is equal to the command is G curve. And I say color equals. I always think of red when I think of temperature. So we're going to say that the temperature is red. 
temp graph, oh, not temp graph, I want a pressure graph. Yeah, press graph, there we go, just so that these two are the same length. Not that that really counts for anything except it's visually pleasing. Uh, G curve, color equals, let's go with color.blue, sure. And then what I can do down below is whenever I calculate these things, um, yeah, let's go ahead and keep printing them and let's add to these curves temp graph dot plot. You're saying add something that has a position of the time and the temperature. And then I do the same thing with press graph. Press graph to continue. Uh, position equals T comma. I suppose I may as well define and may as well define a quantity called average pressure equals this thing AVG pressure T comma AVG pressure there we go cool alright let's so what this is gonna do now is it's gonna add another window uh, where it will graph for me the kinetic energy and the pressure of course the pressure starts out at zero because there haven't been any collisions with the side and then it's gonna jump up Oh, and I am being a bad physicist. I have graphed temperature and pressure, which have wildly different units and wildly different scales uh, on the same graph. So that is my bad. That is not good. Uh, that is not good practice. Um, so tell you what, let me uh, uh, take a second. I'll look up how to give these things different displays. I'll be right back. Okay, so I have done some searching on ye trusty internet, um, and uh, I, I've played around with these display options before, and this has just confirmed to me that I need to be using them more frequently. So what I've done is I've made separate displays, or specifically separate G displays. G display is what you want to use when you're doing a graph. Display is what you want to use when you're creating the animation. Um, within each one of them, I've specified the title, so for temperature, for pressure, bouncy ball animation. I've also given them different locations within the screen so that you can see them all at once. And lo and behold, uh, to my left is the temperature graph. Uh, it's going to remain relatively consistent. Um, immediately below me is, of course, the animation, so I'm sitting on the uh, animation window now. Although now it's zoomed in a little bit. I must have changed the zoom factor or something. Okay. And then of course uh, below me and to my left is the graph of the average pressure. So it does uh, jump up a bit during the beginning and then it does seem to kind of level off decently here. Um, so what I could do for example at this point would be to evaluate uh, my average temperature and my average pressure. Um, you notice that the average pressure is changing uh, by is changing less dramatically each time. It does seem to follow the same general pattern though. That's interesting. Um, but you notice it's it's varying less each time because each time the contribution of the next term is going to be less because it keeps getting outweighed by uh, by all the others um, because of the way we've got the calculation set up that the total pressure keeps getting added to and the average pressure is a total pressure divided by the total number of, of uh, iterations we've been through. Um, so yeah, so it's hovering, you know, around, around here somewhere. Okay, cool. Um, so what I could do, for example, now, what I could do is I could let this simulation run for a while. Um, I could let the simulation run for a while and then I could collect the the average temperature value the average temperature value and the average pressure value and then I could make a change to the code I could change for example the uh, the the uh, the maximum velocity that the bouncy ball start out with that's basically a measure of that's basically control over the uh, kinetic energy and then I'd get an idea of you know how the um, and then I could get an idea of how the average pressure varies with the average kinetic energy. According to the ideal gas law, uh, those should be linear, right? PV equals nRT uh, or MRT, depending on you know which class you're in and which R you use. Uh, so as the average kinetic, excuse me, so as the average temperature goes up, I should see an increase in the average pressure. Uh, now I don't want to have to do that myself. 
I can get the computer to do that for me. So I'm going to save this under yet another file name. I'm going to save this under TNP um, results or TNP, TNP experiment. There we go. And what I can do is I can get rid of the, uh, the, the, the graphing stuff because I don't necessarily need that. What I want to do is I want to have the computer automatically loop through uh, this stuff for me. So what I can do is the, the, the thing that I'm interested in changing, let's see, I, yeah, that's fine. The thing that I'm interested in changing is this, uh, where did it go? Where do we initialize the velocities? The thing I'm interested in varying is this maximum momentum. So what I want to do is I want to go back up to the beginning here. I don't need to necessarily have this thing um, change the, uh, I don't need, I don't, I don't necessarily need for this thing to be, uh, you know, re reinitializing the masses every time. I do, however, want it to uh, create a new scene each time. So I'm going to cop. I'm going to cut this and put it down here. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a new loop where I'm going to change the max momentum. And let's see. What did I? How did I start that out? What value did we start with on that one? That one started with a 10. Let's scale that down to a one, and we're going to have the computer run this for us. We're going to have it do uh, while max underscore momentum is less than or equal to 100. So we are going to be varying this thing quite a bit. Um, actually, that might be a little low. Let's 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 stick with a minimum of 10. Because um, basically, what I need to figure out is I need to figure out how much time till it's run for. I think I'll let this run till a max time of 10. Um, so basically what I can do here is I can say, well, max momentum is less than or equal to 10, uh, create a new scene uh, for these things to be displayed, and, and now I need to tab everybody in by one. So I've just uh, selected everything until the end and tabbed everybody in, so that's all part of this while loop. So it's gonna create a new animation scene here, cool. And that can go back up to the corner now because I won't have my graphs anymore. Let's see. We're going to keep the box length the same. I don't need to change anything about that. I have commented this out. So the only thing that's going to change with each run is the maximum momentum. Uh, let's see. The other thing I need to change is while t is less than or equal to 10 seconds, we're going to let this thing run for a computer time of 10 seconds. Um, Let's see, I can up the rate here, although I think it's already high enough to where it won't, uh, where it won't it's not gonna change any, it's not gonna run any faster. Um, let's see, I have initialized my total pressure, yes. Uh, let's see what I can do down here. Okay, cool. So then at the bottom, I need to increment um, the max momentum by a little bit. Max momentum equals max momentum is that what I called it? Excuse me, one second. Hello, Miss Pumpkin. Do you want to be on the video? Do you want to be on the video, sweet girlie? Mm -hmm. I love you too. You're a sweet darling. I hear you purring. You mind letting daddy finish this? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, my cat may be periodically joining us. She's decided to uh, climb up on the desk. Um, what did I call this thing? I called it max underscore momentum. Yes, I did. Okay, let's scroll back down. So max momentum because maximum we're going from 10 to 100. So I may as well just increment by say one. Sure, why not? Um, okay, cool. And so then what I want it to do is I want, let's see, at the end of each one of these iterations, I want it to, oh, I don't want it to be graphing these. See, I don't need it to print these anymore. So at the end of all of this, I want, Let's see, so at the end of, of each one of these iterations over the max momentum, which actually needs to come in one, there we go. At the end of each of these, I want this thing to graph, so I do need to create another graph. Let's just call this one uh, GX. I want this thing to graph uh, max underscore momentum, com oh wait, no, wait, actually I don't want that, excuse me. Sorry, I'm trying to graph pressure versus temperature, right. So I want this to be average pressure comma temperature. 
There we go. I know the temperature was declining due to some errors in the code. I'm going to assume that that's going to average out over the course of, you know, 90 runs. Um, so if this thing does, is a good model for the ideal gas salt, then we should get a nice linear relationship out of this. Um, I, of course, need to create my gx.plot here. So I'm going to uh, say gx is, well, first let's make a display for it. So gx scene is a g display uh, title equals temp. Which one did I put at the end? Uh, this is going to be temperature versus pressure. Temp versus pressure. And let's give you an x of 0 and a y of 400. That seemed to work out well last time. And we're going to say gx is equal to a g curve in, uh, let's see, with a color equal to, let's go with red so that shows up nicely. Oh, there is one thing I need to look up, and that is how to delete this display here at the end of the max momentum while loop. Um, let me just look that up really quick. Uh, VPython help, how do I clear a display? <clears throat> delete. You can delete a display named D with D.delete. Oh, that's easy. So let's go with uh, anim scene dot delete. Okay, so if I've set this up correctly, which I think I have, I always think I have. I never think I've set it up wrong. <laughs> Someday I should I should say I think I've set this up wrong and then just you know see what happens. Um, so I've set it up to where I create the animation scene here. That's for all the bouncy balls to live in. Uh, it's going to be deleted here and then recreated in the next one. Uh, that's okay. It just means we'll be clearing it. Um, I've got GX plot with position of pressure comma temperature. So this is gx equals a g curve with the color red, and we've got a g display there, and a display there. Okay, so uh, if this works, so I'm going to hit run, and we'll watch the first couple of seconds of it, and if this thing runs correctly and I start to get my results, then I am going to either fast forward or just cut, I, I, I'm not sure which, um, but either way, I, I will spare you having to watch it, you know, loop over this max momentum over and over and over again. Um, so, and if it does not work, uh, then we'll try a little debugging. And uh, if it's a total disaster, I'll just delete this from the video entirely because I can do that. Okay, and here we go. Okay, so I did find one thing I needed to change. Um, that is I want this to be a G dots, not a G curve because a G curve connects the data points. I want those data points to stand out on their own. So let's run the code again. Um, and so this will take a, a, a little bit for the first couple of, of data points display. I just want to run it and make sure uh, that it runs. And like I said, um, if this thing runs correctly, uh, then I will I'll cut away and then present you with the results, or I'll do a fast forward and you know do something funny in front of the camera. I don't know. Uh, but while we're waiting for this thing to run, let me tell you a little bit about what to expect uh, on Let's Code Physics in the next few weeks. Um, so we will be wrapping up season one uh, in early December. Uh, we'll finish out uh, this series, the subscriber tribute, uh, by making this box of bouncy balls 3D, where we'll be able to test the full-fledged <clears throat> Um, ideal gas law with pressure, volume, and temperature. We did successfully get a data point, hooray. Uh, after this series finishes, we'll have one more series this season on uh, simulating planetary orbits, which is always fun. There's lots of neat uh, behavior that you can get out of that, especially if we add in um, multiple planets to the system. Um, and then we'll do a, uh, a holiday special around mid-December, and that will uh, uh, close things up for Season 1. Season 2 will premiere sometime late January, early February. I haven't quite decided that yet. Uh, there will be, I'll make sure to have an announcement video uh, that will be some fun and things like that. It'll, it'll be great. Um, okay, so I got my, um, this is... Uh, temperature versus pressure. So this thing is coming out. It's linear so far. Well, two dots is going to be linear. It's positive linear so far, which is what you'd expect. Um, 
And so in season two, you can expect uh, some, some I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of doing some sort of larger scale projects. Uh, you know, the projects I've been doing have been fun. I want to keep doing the small scale uh, fun projects, but I also want to get into a little bit more depth. We've had some requests in the comments on doing things in some more depth. Um, so that's something you can look for in season two, starting in, uh, like I said, uh, late January, early February, whenever I can, uh, you know, get my act together after, after winter break. Oh, we've got another data point. Okay, so this code is running fine. Uh, so I'm going to cut and or fast forward here um, and uh, we'll take a look at the results uh, when the code finishes. Thanks. Okay, so it's been something like 10 minutes. I just read the prologue to The Eye of the World uh, with dramatic embellishment. And uh, we've only got 14 data points so far. We are waiting for a total of 90. So I'm going to cut the recording here uh, so that this thing can uh, finish itself up. Um, and then we'll come back and talk about the results in a few minutes. I do notice it's mostly linear in this region, although it seems to be tapering off here. I'm thinking that these are either going to turn out to be outliers or this will turn out to be an artifact of the model. Either way, uh, we will come back when this thing is finished. Okay, so the code took about 20 minutes to run. Um, not too bad. Um, I did go and fold some laundry and wash some dishes and things like that. So I had, I had a productive 20 minutes while all these dots appeared. Um, again, this is a graph of the temperature versus the pressure. I suppose I can make this full screen. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm covering up a few of the dots. Um, here, but that's okay. Um, there is definitely a, a direct relationship, a correlation between the two. Um, so the, generally speaking, the higher the average pressure, the higher the temperature is. Um, so there's a lot of variation to it. Um, that's to be expected to some degree based on the fact that these, uh, uh, you know, the, the velocity distribution is randomized. It's also to be expected, uh, you know, based on the fact that we're, you know, we're not calculating you know pressure as you know a nice smooth quantity but you know we're, we're calculating it over you know in, in little steps um, it's also to be expected in the variation that we got you know we just picked um, 10 seconds as you know an arbitrary cutoff between the two and so you know there's some variation to be expected you do notice that the variation gets higher uh, as we go higher in pressure and temperature. Again, probably to be expected because in, in those cases you know the bouncy balls are being more active so there's more room for for variation but you know if, if you go into you know the sort of the you know the nice region right here it's it's even almost got a linear shape to it so I'm pretty happy with these results I take this to mean that we are modeling these interactions pretty well you could use this um, as an ideal gas simulator uh, if you wanted to so uh, uh, this uh, little calculation of temperature and pressure has been a success. In the next episode, the final episode of our subscriber tribute, uh, we will turn our bouncy ball animation 3D and uh, we'll, we'll see uh, what that looks like. We'll put a make trail on, uh, on one of the bouncy balls and then we'll see if we can also uh, recreate this little experiment and now change the volume of the box. So thanks so much for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.